Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Francesca Iacorto. I'm an advisory board member of the Pearson Centre. I'm also the Senior Director of Public Affairs at the National Airlines Council of Canada. As many of you will know, the Pearson Centre is a progressive centrist think tank that addresses the big economic and social challenges of the day. In that context, I'm pleased to welcome you to the third webinar on major policy issues related to COVID-19 and how it is affecting our society. Today, our subject is the public service. How it has performed over the past two months, its long-term future, as well as governments at large at the federal, provincial, and municipal levels. We have four very knowledgeable panelists who will address these issues. Debbie Davio is president of the Professional Institute of the Public Service of Canada. She has spoken on the Pearson podium several times before, and we are delighted to welcome you back. Michael Warnick is well known as a former clerk of the Privy Council who has spent much of his career working on key aspects of public policy, including the Canadian Constitution and Indigenous Affairs. He has been writing and speaking extensively on the future of the public service in Canada since retiring last year. Linda Terrace is joining us from British Columbia. Welcome, Linda. She is a former Deputy Minister and Head of the Public Service Agency of British Columbia, which is the equivalent of the Pro Public Service Commission of Canada at the federal level. Currently, she is an Executive and Leadership Coach with her company, Terrace Consulting and Coaching. And last but not least, we also have Greg Fergus joining us, who is the Member of Parliament for the writing of Hull Elmer, as well as uh, the Parliamentary Secretary to the President of the Treasury Board. Uh, this panel will be moderated by Andrew Cardozo, who of course is the President of the Pearson Centre, and someone who writes regularly on the public service and public policy. With respect to the format, the panel dis discussion will last about 40 minutes and then we will have time for questions and answers and we will end promptly at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Please use the question box on your screen and we will get to as many questions as we can. With that, I will turn it over to Andrew. Thank you, Francesca, and welcome everyone. Um, I won't do any more intro because I think there's much to say. We live in interesting times the public service and the federal government and all provincial governments and municipal have been doing a lot over the past two months. Uh, so let me just start by asking you all, and I'll start with Debbie Davio, what has struck you most about how things have, have changed and what public servants have been doing over these past two months? Uh, I think first and foremost, I can say that I'm a proud mama as um, president of a union representing about 55,000 federal public servants. I think uh, what's really notable is that they've been quietly competent. Uh, and although, uh, you know, people look at the public service as largely an administrative body, uh, I'm incredibly amazed at the level of frontline work that our members are engaged in as part of this pandemic from uh, developing the CERB and, and other uh, of these benefits to, um, you know, making sure that uh, public servants could work from home and uh, that was key to keeping operations going, um, to developing tests uh, for COVID-19, to converting labs for disinfectant, uh, uh, bringing PPE in, so they're, they're there on the front lines purchasing, uh, making sure that everybody has the personal protective equipment they need, and, uh, and just generally um, building up the technical infrastructure. And I'm just so very impressed with uh, with how well the public service has been able to transition to a largely virtual work and, and simply get the job done. It's amazing. Yeah, um, M Michael, let me ask you, you've been in the role of uh, managing the entire ship. Uh, how do you think it's going so far? Well, I'm experiencing it as a as a retiree locked down at home, and and with the news that I get, uh, you know, over my news feed, um, and I don't have that much direct experience. With it. I, I I agree with everything Debbie said, and you could add to that the people working on negotiating border agreements, the repatriation of tens of thousands of Canadians from every part of the world, people working in consular and immigration, and on and on and on. 
Um, I, I, I extend the shout out to the broader public sector, uh, the provincial and municipal and local people that have made, uh, made all kinds of adjustments, people in health authorities, school boards, universities, uh, community service organizations and so on. Um, I think, you know, it, it not only is the public sector performed really well, and there'll be lots of, uh, you know, going back over the traces and finding things could have or should have been done a little differently or a little faster. Um, but it, in, in many ways, what's impressed me is kind of the dog that didn't bark. We haven't had any major IT failures or bottlenecks or collapses. Uh, not everything's been perfect, but generally uh, things have gone really really quite well uh, and certainly compared to some other public sectors you can think of around the world. So it, I think it's been gratifying and, and uh, it's also been interesting to see how Canadians uh, instinctively and, and even more and more as the thing has progressed have turned to the public sector for help, for uh, continuity, for assistance and so on. And some of the people who were the loudest voices for tax cuts and privatization and deregulation are now running to government for help. <laughs> it's a little bit bemusing and ironic, but I think um, it's really been, a, you know, in some ways, uh, in, in terrible circumstances, an important year for the public sector. Uh, Debbie, can I just come back to you and, and just ask you about the management part of it? A lot of the people, a lot of the people you represent are senior managers. Um, how how have they transition to managing remote teams? Well, I certainly think that the uh, the forced um, change has been beneficial in that regard. I mean, a lot of people are afraid of the kinds of changes that allow people to work remotely, but we've proven now that uh, not only is it possible, but it's productive and. Uh, I know that you know a lot of my remem my members report working harder than ever uh, because you know they're able to continue to do their jobs remotely and uh, you know I honestly believe that this is kind of the kick in the pants that the public service needed to uh, to transform to uh, a modern public service and one that can really take advantage of flexible ways to work uh, while still being assured that the job gets done. Yeah. Okay, uh, Greg uh, Fergus, I'll ask, I'll ask you, uh, and you come at this at least in two ways. One is you're a member of parliament for Hull Aylmer, so a lot of uh, federal public service servants are in your riding. And the other thing is your parliamentary secretary to the Treasury Board. Uh, share with us your thoughts on, on this change. Well, I'm glad you pointed out that I was a member of Parliament for Hull Elmer. So my riding is right in the national capital region. And so this has been my home for over 30 years. And I've, I, you know, I, I, I live the public service uh, every day. My neighbors, my friends, uh, relatives, they're, they're public servants. So it, it's, a, it's a very real uh, situation for me, uh, not only just as being uh, the parliamentary secretary to the Treasury Board, I think both uh, Michael and Debbie have raised all the right points. I mean, it's been outstanding. I, not just it was not just good; it was outstanding work by the public service in terms of how they uh, were able to bring in uh, the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit, uh, repatriating Canadians, keeping the operations, keeping the lights on on government, and still carrying out all the services, but uh, from home. And not only that, by by building a, a digital infrastructure, which which comes into play, and doing that, and not being able to control the things that they can't control, like how Bell Canada or our, our service providers, you know, all the traffic that came on all at once onto the phone system, onto our internet system. Uh, it's amazing how the public service has really performed. I think they've done an incredible job. But I think the most impressive thing is not the things that they were able to develop. I think it's also the way, the, the attitude which they've had. It's been a very responsive public service. So we've introduced programs, discovered that it wasn't hitting the mark, stopped them, and reintroduced a better program. So we've, we've corrected it uh, on the fly. And usually that doesn't happen. Usually we would want to make sure that we get it perfectly right the very first time. Um, this has really shown uh, a public service that can respond in real time uh, and to adjust on, you know, on a dime uh, as to how we had started off. Remember when we first started off, there wasn't a program that, you know, the things that were supposed to happen was that the, 
uh, by increasing liquidity into the into the banking sector, that that should have been enough for private companies to be able to receive uh, 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 some loans. But we saw, you know, the politicians. We saw that this wasn't happening. We we messaged that back. The government turned on a dime and had you know uh, government backed loans which are being delivered through the financial institutions. Same thing with uh, the pre runner to the uh, to the CERB. Uh, uh, was uh, another program similar to EI, $500 a week. And anyhow, we turned that all around, rolled an EI into it and ran it through uh, uh, the good folks in, in, in Debbie's union uh, who, who came up with the program uh, through the Canada Revenue, Revenue Agency. And that's what we have today. So uh, to me, the fact that we have a higher tolerance for error and willing to try new things and then respond as we see it play out, I think that's the new... Uh, the really new element to all of this. And I think that's what made Canada's public service. If we thought it was great before, it's outstanding now. And, and, and activists, and, sorry, go ahead, Debbie. I was just gonna add that, uh, you know, a lot of these programs had to ramp up capacity and do so quickly. And the only way to do that was actually to have public servants from other areas of government volunteering to take on those roles. And I think yeah. that's really notable too, the flexibility of the workers uh, and uh, and the willingness of everybody to work together to collaborate in, in ways that no one ever imagined uh, would be required, but, but worked. And, and add to this the other strange circumstances where people have got their kids at home, they're trying to school them. There are all the health issues and be, being locked home at home and all that, and concerns about parents who are in seniors' home. It's uh, really quite uh, quite an amazing situation. Uh, Linda Tereska, tell us a bit about British Columbia. How are things going in your province? Well, I would agree. I think things are going extremely well. I've been very, as a former public servant, I've been very proud of uh, of my former colleagues and how they're handling it. I'm not surprised though. A lot of what has already been said. Um, is certainly true here in the province as well. Um, this is when government shines, in my opinion. Um, there is a very good, solid foundation on which to manage these kinds of issues. Um, I lived through the sort of whole H1N1 era in, um, in British Columbia at that time, and of course that pales in comparison to this, but I know from the inside that there's uh, a lot of whole of government uh, you going on looking at the issues from a variety of different perspectives and this is when people really come together and collaborate and yes we do see people at the provincial level as well moving across organizational boundaries picking up the slack helping out where the where the pressures are um, and I think uh, I think that, that that infrastructure that whole emergency management infrastructure that exists in BC is uh, serving us well the whole of uh, uh, philosophy and values of the public service is serving us well. Um, in BC, we had a bit of an advantage from a work at home perspective in that in 2012, there was a whole policy regime and a whole sort of strategy put in place to uh, to move people into uh, flexible working arrangements. And so a lot of that technology infrastructure already existed and uh, the policy infrastructure to support people working home already existed. So that was good. But we can't remember that there are, we can't forget that there are a lot of frontline workers here mm -hmm. at the provincial level that are providing on the ground services mm -hmm. to people. And that becomes very, very difficult in these circumstances. You know, everything from people who are trying to deliver benefit checks to people in the downtown east side to uh, people who are trying to uh, manage border uh, crossings and, and um, new policy and, uh, in airports and things like that. And also, um, you know, people who are, well, the courts aren't really running at their, but there's, you know, there's essential services that are needed at all kinds of levels, uh, the correctional facilities. Um, there's all kinds of people that, that have no choice but to go to work and they have to go to work under very different circumstances right now and, and they're doing the best job they possibly could under the circumstances that's for sure yeah. and you can i can just uh, build on it a little bit um maybe uh, because i think we, we're all violently in agreement <laughs> um part of the challenge i build on on debbie's point is can we bring the same mindsets and a build and, and flexibility and new approaches 
to more normal kind of peacetime environments. We've always been good at emergency management. You can go back to 9-11 or the Fort McMurray fire or H1N1 or evacuating people from Lebanon. When there's a crisis, people respond and they do amazing things and they tend to get prizes and recognition in National Public Service Week events. The, the, you know, the untold story here, and, and it'd be invisible to many Canadians, is the many, many people who just slog away making programs better, working on renovating IT mainframes so that EI checks can be delivered. Just, you know, steady, gradual learning and improvement of, of public sector services and institutions. And they don't get much attention. And I, I do think we're, if we overfocus on the heroic and the emergency, we're kind of missing part of the point, which is the value of steady, competent delivery by, by, a, by a competent public sector. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree that uh, I think the public sector is always just um, quietly competent. Uh, and it's just a time like this that's really highlighting how important the work that the public sector is doing. Uh, and uh, And hopefully, that is not soon forgotten by Canadians who, you know, don't seem to understand the value of government until they really need us. And, you know, I, I certainly think that uh, that we're up to the challenge. I also think that um, there's a, a certain level of, of risk that we're ready to take in this environment that we're not usually ready to take. And it's that um, risk taking that is generated, you know, much quicker deliverables uh, and the ability to sort of let public servants do what they do best. And, uh, and I hope that we'll be able to take some of that away into our new normal. Yeah, but what we've done is we've pushed off the 13 officers of parliament and the kind of the you know, ex post reviews of what could have, should have been done differently. They they will show up in the fall and the winter. And as I posted before, I hope when those audits and reports and studies come in the winter, people remember, the, you know, the working conditions yep. and the challenges that people had back in March and April. But uh, people tend to forget the context in which people were, were doing that work. There's also, I think, a bit of a back, risk of backlash the longer this goes on because private sector workers have taken a more immediate hit to their paychecks and their jobs. They're being laid off, they're losing income. And public sector workers, by and large, have not. Uh, you see the unemployment rate in the national capital region is half of the national average now. And eventually, there will be people in the more populist wing of politics, the kind of Rob Ford, not Doug Ford, who will be looking for cutting, you know, a more more of a contribution and sacrifice from public sector workers if this goes on well into the summer or there's a second wave in the fall. Okay, and, uh, I just want to talk about the next few months if I could. Um, if this carries on for, let's say, four months, eight months, uh, Debbie, do you think we can carry on operating in this manner where people are working remotely and still delivering the services? Uh, Absolutely, I do. Although uh, I do note that there are some people who, you know, are at some sort of greater risk from working at home. And there are some areas where uh, it's not necessarily conducive to working from home. There's a lot of protected uh, documents, privacy concerns. I mean, I, I you know, you think of um, tax auditing, for example. Uh, or uh, you know medical adjudicating there are a lot of um, privacy concerns that need to be considered and we would certainly need to shore up uh, our ability to be able to ensure that those safety and security and privacy issues are dealt with but from a purely um, technical standpoint and and looking at uh, you know, our productivity during this period, I would say absolutely yes, we have the ability to continue to work this way. Uh, investments are being made and so the capacity is um, increasing and I think once those investments have been made, we'll be all shored up and ready uh, to continue to work this way and uh, there's all kinds of advantages to following that and, path. And those so, investments you mean are things like IT? Yeah, IT uh, equipment, you know, uh, setting people up to be able to um, to work effectively from their home offices. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit of um, change management or, or learning new tools um, to be able to work effectively that way. But 
I, I firmly believe that uh, it, those investments are already being made and in a number of weeks, uh, I think we're going to be completely ready to continue to work this way. But there will be an issue with staff burnout in some organizations, like personal resilience of just working all the time, being on call, work from home also has created expectations of availability. People have some really tough balancing acts with kids. If the schools don't reopen, the crunch yeah. on people is going to be really severe. And I think if we get into the summer, we're going to have to be very skillful at dealing with burnout. Yeah, I, um, I agree with that. I, there's been a lot of there, there's been a lot of um, issues. The, the issues that I have seen have been raised where there were cracks in the in the mortar already. You know, leadership, uh, leader, weak leadership, or lack of communications uh, uh, channels open to help communicate in a virtual world. And uh, and and as you pointed out earlier, Andrew, people have children wandering around their their desk at home and uh, a lot of additional um, uh, pressures that wouldn't normally be there. So it isn't so much can people work at home, it's can they work at home continually in this environment? And I think that's the issue. Yeah, Amanda, are you I think that's a good, um, a good uh, clarification. For sure, uh, the, like I said, it's not good for everybody and it's not safe for everybody. And so there's concerns around um, domestic violence at home and increased levels of that. Uh, certainly the issues around childcare or other family care that might be required are, are um, complicating things. But again, going back to how I started, I was just amazed at how quietly competent the public service has been at making this transition. And although I agree with the point that some people are having to go over and above because uh, their work is just that critical, I think over time we would um, likely become better at balancing all that out uh, and making sure that uh, everybody was able to do a reasonable uh, level of work, uh, keeping in mind those other factors. Linda, is there a need to um, train senior managers um, to to operate and to manage in a different style at this point? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that um, there has been a lot of that done, but for people who are working at home for the very first time, it is a different way of managing. And uh, I think that uh, it, again, it's, it sort of shows some cracks in, in, in the, in the uh, training sometimes when uh, people are not communicating as effectively as they could in this environment. And, you know, it's a different scenario to be able to manage performance somehow. I, I, I don't know. It's a different when somehow when people s see people in the hallway and they brush elbows with them and it happens sort of more organically, uh, it's very difficult for them to make a, a, a shift into a very traditional or very um, uh, formal kind of uh, you know, you've got to think more carefully about how do I communicate, how do I set goals, how do I follow up and and uh, and give feedback to people when I, you know, I don't just sort of occur or run across them in the hallway. So yeah. it is a diff different way of managing, and I think there is some training for it. Absolutely. Yeah, and Linda, I'm, brushing elbows. There's a concept we haven't seen for a long time. Yeah. Um, Greg, <laughs> Greg, can I ask you um, as a as a member of parliament, you're dealing you're, you're dealing with issues of the public service, but the government also has to govern on a whole lot of other issues as well, which we haven't touched for the most part over the last two months. How do you think that's all going to work out in the, the rest, let's say from now till the end of this calendar year? Are you going to, is the government going to be able to manage this whole COVID thing because it's going to be with us for some time and do all the other things that a government has to do? I think we will do so imperfectly, uh, but that I think you could say at any time. And this, you know, whether or not it's from a political standpoint or from a public administration administrative standpoint, I think that 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 analysis holds. You know, we're, we're talking about having it. You know, managers are, there, there are there are faults in the system or there are cracks in the wall, but there are always cracks in the wall in whatever system yeah. that we we work in. It's what the times require is us to. Uh, value different skills so 
you know, perhaps the skill of, of bringing people together, of great communication might not have been as valued as much as getting results done. Uh, but now we're seeing that if we're going to have a public service that's going to be partially uh, in the office towers downtown uh, and partially uh, at home, then you're going to require a different set of skill sets, uh, skill sets as a manager or as uh, as a public servant to be able to provide that. Same thing for politics. Um, if uh, you know we are uh, whatever time before we actually have a vaccine, um, and if it's uh, if it's a if it's deemed to be a a danger for you know 338 people from across the country to be in close quarters together, uh, then we're going to have to adapt. Uh, we're going to have to figure out a way to get all the things that need to be done, uh, all the legislation that needs to be taken care of, uh, and do it in a different way. Some of it virtually, some of it in person. That is going to require a whole new skill set for all of us. It's going to require some innovative thinking as how we're going to get that all done and to do it in a way that we're making sure that the business of the country is being addressed and that the needs of the people are being raised. But does that mean that we have to go back to exactly the way the system was? I think the circumstances will dictate at least until we get a vaccine um, that we're going to have to figure out some new and innovative ways to deliver that. Uh, Debbie, over the past, uh, I think, few decades, there's been a tendency towards a certain amount of privatization. My sense is most of what's happened in the past two months has been done, at least federally, by your permanent public service. Um, do you think we're going to have a change in that discussion about privatizing government or is this just are we going to get back to that in a little while? Well I sure hope so. I mean when you contrast the amazing accomplishments of public servants in the development of these new applications to, uh, to what happened with the public service pay system Phoenix it's clear that uh, that there's a better way, and uh, and the better way is to use the aptitudes and the the capabilities of the people that you have, and that makes sense um, not just for my members whose jobs it is to do that work, but it makes sense for government uh, from from a standpoint of saving money because we know that these contracted out projects cost anywhere between two and ten times as much as the projects that we do internally. Uh, but even from an a ongoing capacity standpoint, we've already noted that a strong public service was really important in getting us through this pandemic and has been really important through other crises in our history. And, uh, and if you want a strong public service, you have to have a public service that's able to operate on its own aptitudes and its own capabilities and not be handcuffed or, or reliant to private sector corporations whose, whose mandate isn't to serve Canadians, their mandate is to make money. And so I really believe that, well, I've always believed, not, not just now, uh, that it's the right answer for Canadians and it's the right answer for the, the public service and it's the right answer for the government to, uh, to look at ways to um, utilize its own workforce and less, um, you know, contracting out to companies who we don't really know uh, what their motives are, but their goals are not likely aligned with ours. Part of, part of this will come from the political arena, um, Greg's world. I mean, there are politicians out there openly saying we should privatize big parts of the CBC or Canada Post. It'll come from politics more than internally. I think it, um, the, the question of sort of the mix of private and public is going to play out a lot more in provincial governments. Uh, we are going to have a conversation about how we care for our seniors and the role of public care versus private care. What if it's a private public institution, sorry, private care institution subsidized by taxpayers' dollars? What should the expectations be on private operators? This plays out a little bit in schooling. It plays out in in, in other sort of public services, more at the local and the provin and the provincial level. But the mix of public and private is, you know, even in healthcare, veterans care. You know, you can imagine a lot of areas. This is the sort of the fabric of our politics, and uh, I don't think it's going away as a debatable issue. Okay. We, we are going to have another webinar on seniors care in about two weeks, but I'll just ask uh, Linda and Greg to, to, uh, to ask you if you've got any comments on that on that issue. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what Michael said. I think it is uh, sometimes uh, a political 
uh, uh, issue that sort of uh, furthers those conversations. But as public servants, we have to be really clear about why we're why we're do, why we're making the choices that we're making in terms of whether it's public or private and what benefits are coming from that. I do think that there are some great examples of good public private partnerships and uh, and outsourcing that has happened at, at least in BC. Um, again, being clear about why you're doing it, being clear about what kind of partner you're choosing, being clear that that partner shares the values that you share as an organization, and being clear that you're capitalizing on the skill set of the public service at the same time as you're capitalizing on whatever the private partner brings to that brings to that equation, I think is an important thing. Um, but I do think it will be an ongoing issue that will be will be debated, and uh, and we're getting better at managing it over time. I would say. Yeah, Greg. I, I, I I'm going to make a little bit of a uh, make a heretical comment here. I think one of the reasons why you've seen overwhelming uh, 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 popularity of public service now uh, at this time during this crisis is that the public service stepped up to the bat and delivered. So I'm not certain if it's a question of private or public. I think the question is, are we delivering? Are we able to de demonstrably show as a public service uh, uh, results for Canadians and I think that you know as a politician I think that's the fundamental barometer that I'm judged at uh, whenever I go to the peoples at the polls um, have I delivered and I think as a, as a government have we delivered and if we could keep if there's anything that attitude that we can keep uh, out of this crisis and how well the public service has kept has has performed if we can keep that attitude in, in front and center can we deliver uh, so that Canadians see the services uh, that we're providing and, and realize the great value that they get for it, I think then, uh, you know, the, the, it'd be very hard to undo that. Um, it's if Canadians don't see the public service delivering on the goods, uh, that that's when uh, other options will start looking a lot more attractive. Okay. So this, this has been an opportunity for us to... Um, uh, you know, to really shine, the public service to really shine. However, even before this, there's, it's, it's. I mean, personally, I believe that the public service can deliver on, on most things. And I don't deny that there are some areas where it's appropriate to bring in uh, contracted services, but, but not um, wholesale contracting out of, of public services. I think, uh, again, going back to values uh, and, and evidence that, uh, that we've been able to deliver on these projects, but also that we've been able to deliver on these projects in the most cost efficient way possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't want to lose sight of that because people often think that it's the reverse, that somehow it's more expensive to deliver a service through the public service than through, through the private sector, and it's not true. And so long as we can um, both check the boxes that we've delivered on projects and that we've done it in a cost-efficient way, I don't see why any other choice would be taken. Okay, I would I, just I, like to add to this that, you know, it's it's. I don't disagree with what either Greg or Debbie have said. I think it's important to remember, though, at least at the provincial level, what, where I'm uh, more knowledgeable, that although it's the face of the public service that's being presented to the public, there is private sector partners in behind those services that are being delivered. Checks are getting cut, phone calls are being are being uh, uh, answered by private sector partners that are working in cooperation with public services to deliver some of those some of those services. And as Greg says, as long as it's delivered, uh, the government uh, is the one that benefits. And it's really important that you just keep telling that story of, of whatever it is, whether it's extraordinary or ordinary, the value that citizens and taxpayers are getting from their public sector. If you, are, if you don't continuously tell that story with confidence in as many media as possible, it gets crowded out. Uh, there are lots of people out there that want smaller government, lower taxes, are quick to find fault. They have an ideology that private is always better than public. And they are active, and uh, the progressive side of the debate, I think, has been too passive and sat back in it. Okay, per perfect. That's the issue I want to go to next. Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, Debbie and then Greg, what are your thoughts about how 
you make the best and remind people about the value of the public service and not get taken over by the anti-government message. And, and, and the worst case scenario is you're seeing in the US where you've got mm -hmm. terrible opposition to the shutdown, which is a combination of a whole lot of other toxic stuff as well. Look at, uh, first of all, I want to remark that uh, I think Michael just told me I was being too passive on the issue of contracting out. So, Greg, when I come knocking at the door, you can blame Michael. Uh, but um, go for it. He's a, he's a constituent on top of this. Oh, on top of it. Uh, actually, Greg is my member of parliament. So, uh, so we've got lots of opportunities to work together on 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 solving uh, some of this stuff. So. Uh, I'll I'll uh, defer to Greg on the question and uh... <laughs> <laughs> nice pass. Over to nice pass. Look, uh, I, I think you know briefly the the, the real issue is um, it, I mean Michael sort of pointed out we just have to continue to show that value and uh, you know it's a terrible thing I do not I, I only wish them the most success possible uh, and every success uh, but we're seeing something well short of that uh, south of the border. Um, and we're seeing that well short of that in a whole bunch of countries where they have more reactionary forces, which which often try to denigrate and belittle uh, uh, government and public services. Uh, this pandemic, this worldwide pandemic has shown uh, everyone uh, the importance of collective action, coordinated collective action. And uh, I think Canada and the countries that are probably going to do well uh, when we look back on all of this are the countries that have a strong uh, public service, that have low corruption, uh, and that have a public mindedness that I think, uh, and, and a, more of a community trust uh, that exists. And, you know, I think the proof of the pudding is, is in the fact who's going to get out of the, this with uh, the least amount of damage. So for sure, you're... and for our part, you know, as a as a union, of course, we're going to um, loudly and proudly uh, remind people of the amazing work that the public service is doing right now. And and you know, when we get out of this pandemic, uh, we're going to continue those conversations with Canadians and and hope, uh, you know, and. I, I noticed that we we haven't really talked a lot about austerity and how that's going to impact on the public service, but I think that's on the flip side of the coin of all of this. Um, the public service has done amazing work. They're going to continue to do amazing work. Canadians uh, are, are their faith in in um, the public service is increasing, and the more good work we do, the more uh, they're going to like us. But uh, but when um, push comes to shove and there is uh, a big deficit to address, it has been the habit to go looking for those cuts on the back of the public service. And I'm hoping that uh, that won't be the case this time, that um, that it'll be, uh, you know, something we need to address together and we need to address um, smartly, but not simply by slashing and burning the very services that, that got us through this pandemic. Right. Yeah. There's one thing which I mean, we've been talking about public service because that's what the issue is about here, but we also have to point out uh, there are a whole bunch of uh, people who have shown great worth in the private sector, the essential workers, the people who are stocking our shelves, the yeah. people who are working as, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, the the seniors homes uh people i mean there's a whole group of folks who we've underpaid for a long period of time uh and who are doing exceptional work putting themselves in danger every day uh, we also have to recognize that they've done some incredible work yeah. uh and well, yeah, a very yeah. big part of the agenda will be to do better by those private sector workers uh, it appears now that a lot of what happened in the Quebec nursing homes was capping people at 15 hours work so they had to go work at more than one place. There are all kinds of conditions of work issues uh, affecting private sector workers. Uh, to go back to my earlier point, who don't have the job security, the defined benefit pensions, the, you know, the health and benefit coverages, uh, there's an urgent need to do better by, by a lot of our private sector workers. There's a whole agenda of things we've learned from this experience, the fragility of small businesses, the fragility of gig workers, and, and, and so on. What are we going to do with the senior system and so on? 
So, you know, there's a big conversation there. I agree with Debbie uh, that we're going to have to figure out, um, okay, we've run up the bill by, a, let's say, $200 billion in debt. Do we need to pay that all off in three years or can we take 10? Uh, you know, can we run the government at Stephen Harper's tax base or do we need to play with, with revenues, that, you know, which is going to get Greg in a lot of trouble if he proposes raising revenues? It's a very... And, and Area. Yeah, very do we need to race to the bottom to address yeah. it, you know, and is that really what's in Canada's best and, interest? Even when we resolve that, keeping the confidence of the public is going to require continuing to deliver responsive, effective, modern services. We can't get complacent, rest on our laurels, feel good about this year. It's that spirit of continuous improvement, always trying to do better, that we'll have to keep as well. So can I just ask you all to comment on, 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 on the one issue that we just raised, which is the low wages that are being paid to so, more, so many people who we now think of as essential workers. Do you think that's really going to change? Because it's not just a matter of government making a policy and spending money. It means that we're all going to have to be willing to pay an extra 25 or 50 cents for a cup of coffee um, and everything else. Uh, do you think society is willing to see that this is a terrible injustice and and inefficiency in our society. Do you think we're going to change on this and governments will be prepared to increase minimum wages on the one hand and we're going to be willing to fork out a little bit more money? I think it's going to require a lot of advocacy on behalf of Canada's unions and those that represent workers uh, and they're going to have to come together with a focused effort to um, to get these uh, to get these people you know to an adequate level. Uh, but, you know, though, certainly it's been highlighted during this pandemic, and so now is an opportunity that you can hopefully change some people's minds about it. But, uh, you know, people never want to give up something for somebody else, and especially when so many Canadians are hurting. And uh, going back to a point that was raised earlier, the, um, that, the, you know, there are people in the public that are starting to... Uh, have a bit of um, negative feeling towards public servants just because they keep their jobs. Uh, and there seems to be some sentiment out there about public servants at home on leave with pay, you know, on a paid vacation. And I, I really want to just um, address that briefly because that is truly not the case. Uh, I've yet to see the actual statistics, but at least, uh, you know, the information I'm receiving from members has a very uh, high percentage of our members who are actually continuing to work, many of them uh, in the office. So a lot of IT workers had to continue their work in the office. Uh, of course, nurses working in remote and northern communities are all on the front line. People working in the microbiology lab in Winnipeg, I thought uh, quite interesting uh, there was a small outbreak in the microbiology lab and the media jumped all over that and when I so I, I found out from the media and when I went to my representatives in that workplace and asked them did they have concerns and what did I need to be telling the media the response I got was you need to make sure that this building does not get closed because the work that we're doing here is too important. You know, they're developing a vaccine, they're working on other therapeutics, they're working on sanitation of PPE equipment, and the, the people working in that building just wanted to be sure that they wouldn't close the building and be sent home. And so I really just wanna highlight uh, yeah. that, that the public service um, has been far more active, very quietly, uh, active than, than the public even knows. And so there will be a, a task for all of us to make sure that that good word gets out there. Greg, did you have a thought on, on is? Yeah, is, I, 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 unfortunately, I think we have short attention spans um, and I think it would require a second wave uh, for us to really understand the true value of those uh, people who are in the gig economy, essential workers, people who are not well compensated right now, not well valued, if that's a measurement of, uh, if, if their salaries or wages are, 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 are a measurement of that value. Um, it's going to take that second wave for us to really drive that point home that these folks are, are so necessary to making our society work. Yeah. Okay, I'll go to see. Yeah, sorry, very quickly, Michael. We can start with provincially regulated seniors' homes. 
I mean, there are places where government can lead through regulation and labor standards. So you can at least start yeah. there. Yeah, uh, Linda, any thoughts about major changes? Yeah, I, I've always said, you know, don't waste a good crisis, right? <laughs> and uh, I mean, we've never seen anything like this, that's for sure. But we've seen other events in the past that actually have led to good opportunities. And I think that it's incumbent on all of us, uh, both politicians and public servants, to really examine uh, what we've learned from this experience and what we can take forward into the future that will help make a lot of things better in our society. Okay, well, we'll yeah. thank you, Linda. We'll, we'll go to a few questions that we've had uh, come in online. Um, let me ask you the first one. So, how, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to interpret this, but how did you in, avoid, how did the public service or the government avoid having um, a Phoenix kind of fiasco around this? And what if we did have a fiasco like that going forward? Can we manage that in this kind of working environment. Can I take that question? Sure. Uh, the big difference between the CERB and these other benefit applications that are being developed in Phoenix was that all the work was done in-house, whereas with Phoenix, all the work was done by uh, a contractor out side of the house and you know public servants really understand the complexity of government systems best and they're they're required in order to uh to bring in these new systems so uh you know i think the the risk um going forward is not to serve or these benefits which we've already proven uh are are up and running but some of those older systems like our um, employment insurance system and um, CPP and those um, systems that are all slotted for upgrade and most of which were on the same path that Phoenix was on in terms of how those upgrades would be uh, would be done and I, I think really important now the government goes back to the drawing board takes a look at the actual evidence of who can deliver what and and who has what ability uh and uh you know get away from the ideology of private versus public and and really get to who can um deliver these applications because it would be terrible if we had a phoenix on an outward facing system it's terrible that we have it on an inward facing system and so many public servants are affected uh, but uh, if it happened on a, on something like OAS or CPP or uh, employment insurance, it would be absolutely devastating. And that's a lesson that really has to be taken away from, from what happened here with the pandemic. Okay, uh, Debbie, another question. Do you know the percentage of uh, federal public servants who are working from home these days? Do we know that I yet? I, I don't. Uh, I know it's quite high because a number of departments and agencies have started to uh, put non-critical functions back to work and uh, and at the moment uh, a lot of the work that um, can't be done is really just face-to-face -face work with Canadians and uh and, but um but i think uh, the large portion of public service work is ramping up again uh but i couldn't tell you what the number was of critical workers i just knew that i was so surprised to find out how high it was how many of our members and uh were still working right from the get-go of the pandemic and i would venture a guess but it's really just a guess at around 50 percent and that number has been ever increasing since mid-march as as the capacity to work increases okay greg do you have any sense of that figure as to how many people are working from home no, I don't have the uh, the numbers in front of me. I do know that they are in the process of collecting those numbers. It wasn't one of the first things that uh, we, we 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 weren't counting pencils when we were uh, trying to uh, get these programs and keep the lights operating. Um, but I do know uh, as we continue to go through a number of uh, committee hearings that are coming up, uh, especially with the standing committee and government operations, I think that answer will get responded. Uh, oh, in, in the the term. Term. Like most I mean, a lot of people, I think you referred to it, office towers in Ottawa, and that's that's just not where most public servants work. Most of them work in other communities, and a lot of people are out on the front line at border crossings and airports and in factories doing inspections, and, and like there's a lot of people are out there, um, and I think some of the challenges people have had has not been so much their office tower is closed, 
is they were road warriors doing work out there in communities or in you know doing inspection work or whatever or going to indigenous communities and the travel is you know they can't get there anymore so you're going to see well, this impact on other forms of service you know if you're a border guard at uh, you know uh, at whatever or you work in uh, you know you can think of another a lot of functions um, and it's going to depend on how the lockdowns ease, uh, you know, when 55 or 60 percent of the public service is not in the national capital region. It's going to be local public health authorities in Vancouver and Lethbridge and Moncton and others that are going to be making the call on this. Okay. Yeah, and just uh, speaking, oh, yeah, just, sorry. sorry, I just want to uh, generally speaking, Michael, over 50 percent of the federal public service is outside the national capital region. Is that right? It's 55. about 50 50. It's 45-55 right now for the core oh. public service, and that is going to change if I can uh, add an uncomfortable topic for Greg. I mean, I think one of the things that people will have learned is not the work from home part, but it really doesn't matter where the team is located. You can gather people from different geographic locations. So most MPs and ministers do not come from the national capital region. And I think they're going to be um, favoring moving jobs out of Ottawa, decentralizing smaller nodes of work spread more across the country. And I suspect 10 years from now, that share that's in Ottawa is gonna be quite a bit smaller. Okay, Linda, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, I was just gonna uh, pick up on that very point is that um, it, I think one of the one of the things that we need to do a better job in communicating with Canadians is is what is actually public service work because when I was in the public service and we were looking at, at uh, our policies we uh, we encountered um, some research that showed us that a lot of private citizens don't actually understand how far uh, government goes uh, with respect to the services so that's a big issue and when I look at all of the the list that I have in front of me of all of the critical publics the the essential services, people that are still working and continue to work during this pandemic. It includes everything from the obvious health and health services to law enforcement and public safety to all those people involved in the vulnerable populations, community outreach workers, um, uh, housing, people trying to find people houses and beds in long-term care facilities, uh, critical infrastructure, manufacturing, uh, you know, those things, those people that are keeping the supply chains running in, in Canada, uh, food and agriculture. I mean, it goes on and on and on. There are so many people in every community across the province, large cities and small towns that are doing this public service work. And uh, I and think if, it would, it would yeah, surprise I mean, a lot of Canadians to know that one in five workers is a public sector worker. Yes, I think it would. 3.6 million when you include the, the provincial and local government, one in five workers in Canada is a public sector worker. Yeah, and uh, you know, yeah. one thing Michael just said, and it was it was, a, it was a good line, is saying that I would I would fear uh, uh, you know, what what the future may bring. I don't fear that at all. As a matter of fact, I, the the fact is, I think that this crisis has shown that people can work in a whole bunch of different situations, uh, and as long as they have a connection. What I do fear is an ideological bent to say that government has to be x or government has to be y that's the, it's the same thing as saying you have to you know shrink government to such a small point that you can drown it in a bathtub or you have to move everything outside of ottawa because you have to to me those yeah. ideological you know a priori positionings they you know that's the thing that i think we have to make sure that's the thing that we didn't do in terms of responding so well as a public service to this crisis yeah. and i would want us to hold on to that innovative approach that we have uh, and saying that you know good ideas come from different places and we can make that happen but yeah, yeah not an ideological bent on it I, I don't think location makes one bit of difference once we've set up people to work vir virtually it actually makes no difference so even if pressure to move jobs outside of ottawa for example comes what difference does it make you don't have to move because you can connect to a job anywhere in the country and uh and this pandemic has really proven that 
that that's the case. And I hope, like I said, after we've made all this investment uh, and and we've managed the change so so well that um, that there really are some silver linings. And I, I like Linda's line about let's not waste a good crisis because there are opportunities that are arising out of this crisis and the ability to to work remotely, uh, the benefit to the environment, the health and wellness, and uh, even things like recruiting the next generation. I mean, we talk about managers who are afraid to manage remotely or, or who need to make those changes to be able to do that. But there's a whole generation of people who feel quite natural about working that way. And, uh, and we can really just follow their example and and learn from uh, from a different generation uh, about how easily this can be done. Uh, Linda, a question for you. Um, what are the views of the public service and public servants in, in, in a province, in, in your case in British Columbia, what are their views about the federal public service? Do they think they've got it cushier, better, or do you see yourself as just nice allies and everything's equal? That's an ongoing debate that happens. <laughs> Usually attached to salaries, their perception is that federal public servants earn more than provincial public servants. I don't think that's across the board true, by the way, but that's yeah. people's perceptions. Um, you know what struck me about this particular um, scenario that we're dealing with right now is, and, and this is an ongoing, this isn't new, this isn't something that is unique, but it certainly exemplifies it now. There is such great cooperation across the country between federal, provincial, and municipal. And quite frankly, I think that that visible cooperation and and uh, and sharing of, of information has done a lot to increase trust in public service. Um, and frankly, maybe even the politicians in this case, right? Um, so I think that's a really uh, important thing to remember here. Okay. Yeah, Greg, we're making we, you look we, good. We've come to the end of our time. I'm going to ask you for a 30 second comment, uh, starting with you, uh, Debbie. Uh, just thanks so much for uh, for having us out for this dialogue. It's been really uh, great to uh, to chat with uh, all of you and all of the people connected. And uh, let's not forget the amazing work of the public service going forward. And let's not um, lose an opportunity to uh, capitalize on some of the, the benefits and opportunities that, that we've highlighted during this call. And I'll be really happy to continue to work with, uh, with Greg and uh, other decision makers going forward. And I hope that we're really able to, um, to, to make this work, to really find the opportunities and make them shine. Uh, Michael. Well, just in a, in a nutshell, I think there's huge opportunities to move forward, both as a country on, on our overall policy agenda and where we want to go as a country and what we learn from this. Um, but I think that people, uh, normal debate and normal sort of fault lines will eventually reemerge. And for people that believe in progressive politics and a positive role for government in the country, they will have to be active and they will have to make the case over and over again of the value of a public sector and people within the public sector can't rest on their laurels. They're gonna to have to keep working on making it even better. Alinda. Yeah, there's lots of memes on the, on the internet these days about um, telling stories about how we should remember these times and all the great benefits that have come from it. And I hope we do. I hope that this, this experience lingers with us for a long time. And I hope the kind of conversations that we've had today continue on because these are important questions that need to be debated by Canadians, by British Columbians, and I, I hope that we can find um, con this continued cooperation, collaboration will help kind of resolve some of these ongoing challenges. And Greg, last word to you. Well, thank you for that. I, I think uh, what we need to remember is that we've that the public service has shown its value, the importance of collective action, the importance of innovation, and the importance of also being tolerant uh, to to have enough courage to make a mistake and yet uh, acknowledge that and start again. Um, I think if we try to make a public service one that doesn't that minimizes errors, then what we'll do is that we'll also minimize innovation. And mm -hmm. I think that we've shown uh, in this crisis, and this crisis will continue for a while yet, um, is that we need to be to let go of that fear of making a mistake so that we can eventually get to the right policy uh, options that Canadians need. 
Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, all of you for being here. Debbie Davio, Michael Wernick, Linda Terrace, and Greg Fergus, who joined us at short notice. Thank you so much for all of you for being here. Uh, thank you to all the callers and people who sent in questions and our production team, Kathy, Kathy Lanaway and Jay Strauss. I just want to tell you that we've got a series of webinars coming up at the Pearson Center. Uh, the next few will cover issues such as uh, the energy sector, the green energy sector, long-term care, and the effects of uh, COVID on, on women and minorities. So please join us over the next few weeks. If you've been in touch with us, you'll, you'll get emails, keep in touch with our website. Uh, and in the meantime, everybody stay safe, wash your, hand, wash, wash your hands and keep your distance. No, none of that rubbing shoulders for a while. Yeah. Thanks everyone. <laughs> well, Thanks to Pearson Center, this has been great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Andrew.